I mean, we are in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 10 this morning. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 10. In a few weeks, the kids will be going back to school. And so I thought we would do a short series over the next, man, probably just two weeks. <clears throat> and we'll call this series Back to School. We might as well. And we're going to pick up our text in verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is probably one of the, well, it is definitely one of the most important texts in all of Scripture as it pertains to the transmission of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the next generation, what we call around here generally Christian education. And so this is one of those chapters about that subject, about school, about family, about education and the discipleship of the next generation our children and our grandchildren. And so we'll begin in verse 10. We'll begin in verse 10. And when the Lord your God, speaking to Israel, the church of the Old Testament, and when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Amen. Well, the children of Israel, the church of the Old Testament, our ancestors covenantally were between slavery and salvation, so to speak. They were in the wilderness. God had freed them from slavery. However, he had not yet brought them into the full a deliverance of the promised land. And so Moses, the faithful leader of the people, the great shepherd of the people, he looks forward into time, to that time when they would enter into the promised land and they would begin to settle in the land. And they would eat those giant grape clusters that they didn't plant. And they would drink milk from cows that they didn't domesticate. And they would eat honey from bees that they did not tend for 10, 20 years. And they would move into houses that they never built, right? It feels a lot like us here in America, a lot of blessings that we eat and drink and receive that we didn't have too much to do with. We're sort of born into a land of beauty, a land of blessing, a land of comfort, a land of promise, if you will. And Moses, looking forward into that time of blessing and prosperity and comfort, when you have all the food you want to eat and all the, the, the wine you want to drink and the house you want to live in. He looks forward to that time and he's concerned about something. He's concerned that they will forget the Lord. Right? Isn't it true that you pray more to the Lord when you are going through affliction and trial and that when things are good, you forget. You go days on end without mentioning his name. You're forgetting the Lord because life is good. And, and not only is, is the fear that Moses has uh, that they would forget the Lord, it's that they would follow after the gods of the Canaanites. They would go after the gods. Now, you need to understand that phrase, going after a god is following a god. Like Jesus said, come and follow me. Go after Jesus. It's another word for being a student, being a pupil, coming, along, coming alongside of the god and learning that god's ways. Right? He's afraid that they would forget God and that they would forsake God and that they would follow after the Canaanite gods of Molech and Shemash and Baal, etc., and he's not, he's not exactly afraid for the generation that he's speaking to in that moment because they, they saw the Red Sea parted. They put the blood on the doorposts. They've seen the miracles. They experienced the salvation. What he's mostly concerned about is their children and their children's children. It would be several years before they would make it into the promised land and defeat enough of the Canaanites to receive their inheritance of houses and lands and orchards and vineyards. He's talking about, his fear is about the children apostatizing. Amen? He's afraid that the children who inherit so much prosperity and blessing that they didn't necessarily have much to do with, that they will forget the Lord and go after 
become disciples of the gods of the land. He's not only concerned about the children, but he's also concerned about the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. Who here wants their children to follow the Lord? Who here wants their grandchildren to follow the Lord? Their great-grandchildren. Get a vision, Christ Church. Get a vision. Right. That song we sang, life is short. Life is but a breath. You have to have a vision that is, is farther out than the end of your nose. You want not only for yourself to be faithful, but for your children to be faithful and your great-grandchildren to be faithful. And if you look out at the landscape in the United States, a land of blessing, a land of plenty, a land of comfort, you can see quite a bit of apostasy. The generations are apostatizing more and more and more. I found this in Barna. That's a uh, statistics, uh, scientific statistics group. Um, of the generation of the boomers, 10% of boomers, and I'm going to assume everyone knows what that is, 10% of boomers have a biblical worldview. 10%. Generation X, that's my generation, uh, 7% of us have a biblical world and life view. We see the world through biblical eyes. We interpret the things around us biblically. Of the millennials, that would be my wife's generation. Uh, <laughs> that would be most of your generations probably. I mean, many of you, millennials, 6%. You see the trend there. Boomers, 10. Gen X, 7. Millennials, 6. Gen Z, which are, I think, my children's generation, 4%. 4% have a biblical world and life view. Do you see the trend in American Christianity? The trend is toward generational apostasy. The generations are literally forgetting God and going after the gods of this age, which might be the same gods as the Canaanites, because if you look at their religion and the fruits of those religions, it sure looks similar. So we need a plan. The, the, the purpose of this series, just two quick Sundays before the kids go back to school, and, and sorry, homeschoolers, you didn't get a summer break. You know, you're full-time. But uh, this will be a good reminder for you as well. You'll, this will be a good reminder for you as well. The purpose of this is that our children and our grandchildren don't join those statistics. Amen? That's, that is the purpose, okay? And so if that's going to take place, you're going to need more than a sermon series. You're going to need a, you're gonna need a plan. And you're going to need to carry out that plan over a long period of time, persevere in that plan for generations. And so fortunately, we have a plan right here in our text. It's in verse 20 of the same chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20. And I'm going to read through this plan, and I'm going to interpret it and paraphrase it and explain it to you as we read through it, starting in verse 20. When your son asks you in time to come, Moses is concerned about generational apostasy that the generations would forget God and follow after the other gods. So he proposes a plan. Listen, Christ Church, this plan is for us. When your son asks you in the future, in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Daddy, why do we worship on the Lord's day? None of my friends do. Daddy, why... Why do we read the Bible together? None of my friends read the Bible. Daddy, why do I dress this way and talk this way and act this way and look this way? And why are you and mommy in the way that you are? My friend's parents aren't that way. And, and why do we have to give a tithe of our income to resource the church? And, and why this and why that? When your child is old enough to begin to ask, what is the meaning of this? What is the significance of this? We're not like the Canaanites. What makes us different? Why are we doing this? Why do we live this way? Do you see when your son asks you in time, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules? Why do we live this way, dad? When your child is old enough and he's ready for his education, when he's ready for his discipleship, when he's ready to ask why this and why that, and he's drawing distinctions and, draw, and coming to conclusions, what do you need to say to your children, Christ Church? Here it is, verse 21. Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, you see, you have to understand how to read the Old Testament. When you read of the Exodus in the Old Testament, you have to read it as a type, as a sign, as a symbol of the larger salvation of God's people. 
In other words, when your son is old enough to ask you, dad, why this, why that? The answer is the Lord created us. The Lord sustains us. The Lord saved us. The Lord delivered us out of sin, out of death, out of bondage into his marvelous light. Amen. In in other words, when your child is old enough to learn and is asking questions, the first and foremost foundational thing you must tell them every day and live your life in accord with is that old, old story. I once was lost and now I'm found. You know, no, ch- no kid, actually, we once were lost, but now we've been found. That's why we're different than the neighbors. That's why we're different than the people around us. But that's not all, verse 22. And son, the Lord showed signs and wonders. You weren't old enough. You didn't know about it. This happened way back when, when grandma and grandpa, they were living lives of sin in bondage to the devil. And the Lord met them and the Lord delivered them from, from wickedness and sin and saved them and brought our whole family into the church. And, and son, it's been three or four generations since then. You weren't there when that happened. But let me tell you, the Lord showed signs and wonders. If you could have known grandma before Jesus met her, <laughs> the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household. Before our eyes, we saw it. We, we heard the testimonies and he brought us out from there, kid. That, and, and not just that, not only did he save us, kid, he, he did it that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers to deliver to us all that he ever promised, to bless us and to fulfill his promises to us. Christ Church, when your kids are old enough to learn and they begin to draw conclusions and ask questions, the first and foremost and the foundational thing you teach them from which all other things flows is that God saved our family. Welcome to the family, son. Jesus is our savior, our sustainer, our redeemer. That's why we're different. That's why we live this way. That's how to explain life. That's how you interpret life, son. Verse 24, more than that, he not only gave us all of our blessings, son, but and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. See, not only did he redeem us to bless us, but he's also showed us how to live. He's given us this Bible. He's commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. Amen. Are we worried about generational apostasy? We should be. We should be. The rest of the nation, the United States of America, is apostatizing, has been for decades, decades, century, really. And we ought to be concerned about it. And we want to make sure more than anything that our children, the children sitting in here and the grandchildren that they represent, remain faithful to Jesus for years to come. And don't forget God and follow after the gods of this age. Amen. And the only way to do that is from a very early age, you teach them the Bible. You educate them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. You do that from an early age and you, and you, everything else you teach them is to be on that foundation and within those guardrails of holy scriptures. In other words, just to draw a fine line on it, you give your children a Christian, a distinctly Christian education, a distinctly Christian discipleship program from the day they are born until they leave your home, amen? They need to know the Proverbs before they leave your home. They need to know the laws. They need to know the what, the when, the where. They need to know the why. They need to know the wisdom of Solomon. They need to know the narratives of Deuteronomy and Exodus. They need to know our God, amen? Amen. That's the goal, that's the plan. That is our part to play in preserving uh, the name of God and the glory of God here in Acadiana. I want, I, I want to, to be up in heaven, and I don't know how this works, but I want to be up in heaven in a thousand years and look down on Acadiana and see a bunch of Christians down there related to me, amen, and related to all of you, generation after generation of, of faithfulness that no one would forget the Lord and forsake him, how grievous it would be that our kids and our grandkids apostatize. Look at uh, Psalm 103, verse 17. But the steadfast love of the Lord, that is the covenantal, unconditional, ongoing, never quitting covenantal love of Yahweh, his covenantal name. If you were to read the covenant that God has given us to save us, at the top of it would be his name, Yahweh. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting 
on those who fear him. That is those who are loyal to him and swear allegiance to him and live their life according to him uh, ultimately and completely. And his steadfast love is on those who are his righteousness. And he does that to children's children. Let me say that one more time. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. That's an amazing promise, right? His steadfast love is on us and his steadfast love is on our grandchildren. Amen? He's going to be faithful. He desires a godly offspring. His his desires are not going to change. He will be faithful. But look at verse 18. He restates who the covenant is to, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. This is a very sobering lesson. If you do not raise your child in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, if you do not, to put more modern lingo on it, do not give them a distinctly Christian education, If you instead um, hand them over to the discipleship program, programmers and programs of Canaan, you cannot claim this promise. This promise is to those who keep his covenant and are faithful and remember to do his commandments. You can claim mercy and he has been merciful, amen? He steps in where we fail. You can cry out for mercy. But if you are not faithful to do your part with your children, moms and dads, you will not be able to claim this promise. This promise is to those who keep his commandments and keep his covenant and raise up their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. If your child is catechized by Taylor Swift, if your child is completely inundated by the discipleship programs of apostates and pagans and the media, you can ask for mercy, but you cannot claim this promise. You see, the devil knows, Christ Church, how to win. How is the devil going to win Acadiana? He's got to get the kids. How is he winning in America? Because he has the kids. The battle is with the kids. Think about it this way. It's not in my notes, but think about it this way. God creates Adam and Eve. And what does he call them to do? Exercise dominion over the earth. Rule over the earth in my name. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to be fruitful and multiply. Two people can't exercise dominion over the whole earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Have kids. With the Spirit's power and allegiance to God's holy law, with fruitfulness and multiplication, eventually the earth could be dominated or ruled in the name of King Jesus through Adam, his agent. Make sense? Adam, of course, failed that test. But that dominion mandate still remains. It's Jesus Christ, though, now our new Adam, and he calls us to exercise dominion over this earth, rule over this earth according to my law, according to my name, according to my glory, and be fruitful and multiply in order that your rule, your agent rule, can expand further and further and further. No children, no covenantal succession, no ruling over the earth, no fulfilling God's plan for our life. And the devil knows it. The devil knows if he can get the the children, then he can rule. That's why we have to keep our children, amen? That's why we have to disciple our children. The only hope that Acadiana has is the word of God, the Holy Spirit of God who is here among us, and the children of Christians remaining faithful, generation after generation, growing and growing, advancing and advancing, taking over more for the name of Jesus throughout Acadiana. And that's what I want to see when I look down, if this is how it works, from heaven in a thousand years, I want to see Acadiana to be, wow, is that a Christian region down there? Wow, that would be something, wouldn't it? Wow, Is Bro Bridge a Christian town? Wow, wouldn't that be something? It's only going to happen with Christians being fruitful and multiplying and discipling those children in the word of the Lord by the power of the Spirit over a long period of time. That's the only way it's going to happen. And I want to be a part of that, and I hope you want to be a part of it. Amen? That's our plan. When they're old enough and they're asking, give them that old, old story. Give them that Bible. And keep on giving it to them until they move out out of your household. Amen? And you can do that a lot of different methods through a school, through homeschooling. There's a lot of methods, but the principle is transmit Jesus to your children. Amen. But there's more to the plan. Look at verse 4, if you would. A little bit more to the plan here. Um, I don't know about some of you, but one of my daughters uh, loves uh, to, uh, to garden. She loves to garden. 
And I love the garden too. I just haven't done it in quite some time. And, uh, and, and my, my dad loves the garden as well. And I, I know some of you have a green thumb as well. And well, what you do, if you're, if you're gardening on a budget, you have to go to Lowe's and you got to go to the clearance rack. Have you ever been there? It's, mm, the plants don't look great because they haven't been taken care of, but you can get them on a great sale. Now, once you get that, that little plant, you bring it home, stuck down in the dirt of that pot is a little plastic white card of some sort written by a professional botanist, somebody that really knows that plant. And that little, that little card gives you the, the, the conditions that are most conducive for that plant's thriving. Amen? Full sun, part sun, sandy soil, clay soil. They all have different conditions that are most conducive for that particular plant's maximum fruitfulness. Now, we all know that um, some plants, if you don't follow those instructions and you don't plant that plant in, a con in, in an environment that is conducive for it, they can still survive, right? They can still survive. Some of us have house plants that are sort of on their, la they're like on their last leg, right? Our home is like hospice for house plants. Some of you, I've heard someone say that. They're just in here just slowly dying, right? And it's, ugh. but we don't want our children to survive, amen? We want them to thrive. We want to provide for them the conditions most conducive for maximum fruitfulness. So that's another part of the plan. Not only are we going to be teaching them and instructing them in the Bible, in the ways of the Lord, and everything we teach is gonna be built on that foundation, a distinctly Christian education for all of life. That's what we're gonna to give to them in one method or another. We have to do that. That's the, the, the basics. But we want to do that in an environment which is conducive to maximum fruitfulness, conducive to their thriving. Okay? Okay? And here it is, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, you're going to have to follow along now. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, we've covered this before, so I'm not going to take too much time on it. But that word Lord, you can see the all capital letters, that's Yahweh, the covenantal name of God. And when you see Yahweh, what you have packaged in that name is basically the whole gospel. Basically, the whole gospel is alluded to and packaged in that name, Yahweh. So, hear, O Israel, the true Lord, the saving Lord, the covenantal Lord that has all the blessings and promises and promises to be God to us and to our children after us. His name is Yahweh, and he's the one and only God. He's the only God, and he has to be our God. Amen? Hear, O Israel, the true God, Abraham's God, who's given us the promises. He's the real God. Now, here's what you need to do in light of his gospel and in light of his character and his name. You need to love the Lord God. Amen? That's the most important thing in this life is to love the Lord God in response to his covenantal love to you. Love the Lord God, not ritualistically or only on the surface, but love the Lord with all your heart, all the way deep down in your heart. He wants total fealty and loyalty and allegiance. And with all your soul, and with all your might. Amen? <clears throat> Verse 6. And these words that I command you today, that's all the law of God, put them on your heart. They shall be on your heart. Now, who remembers? You, uh, hopefully you remember. It's a few series ago that Jesus was asked, what is the summary of the law? Or what is the most important law? And he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's from Deuteronomy. He added something from another section of Deuteronomy. He said, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. You know that, right? But what's the next commandment? What's the one right under that? I find this very fascinating. Look at verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. See, it's not, it's not enough just for you to be faithful and for you to know the Bible and for you to follow after his laws. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself and teach your children diligently the same. Amen. That is absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 7b. <coughs> and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And we'll come back to this in a second. But you can see it, families. You should be talking about the laws of God and the gospel of God and God and his name and his character. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise all the live long day. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. That's your house. Write it on the doorpost. And on your gates of your town. And write it on the gates of your town. Okay, so on one hand, the plan 
to not be a part of the generational apostasy as it's taking place in America, one part of the plan is to teach diligently the laws of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to our children. Amen. Are y'all awake? Are y'all with me? All right, help me out here. All right, this is important, okay? I want my grandchildren to follow Jesus, and I know you do too. But the second part of the plan is to establish a community that is most conducive to their thriving. A, con a community, an environment, and, and an atmosphere that conveys the truths of Scripture. You know, so it's not just the words coming out of our mouths, but it is the very architecture which exudes the glory of God. Okay, so that's what, that's what this is about. So in your mind, if you will, and we don't, this is not a normal sermon technique, but in your mind, if you will, imagine <laughs> we are all traveling to a, a, an ancient Israelite town, okay? And they love Jesus they are not in apostasy. They are faithful to Jesus. It's an ancient Christian town, okay? And as we walk, <coughs> excuse me, or as we ride our camels to the city, we see the massive archways. We see the architecture of the city. We see the gates of the city. Those gates distinguish the people of God from the people who are not of God. And as we go under those archways and those gates open up, we see written on the architecture of the gates the very laws of Yahweh. We see the name of Yahweh. We, we realize that we are coming into a, a holy city, right? A, a consecrated space that is different than the rest of space. Amen? We recognize that when we come into this consecrated space with the very name of Yahweh and the laws of Yahweh and the gospel of Jesus Christ plastered in the very architecture on the gateways, we recognize that things are going to be distinct here. Things are going to be different. <coughs> this is a different environment. Excuse me. As we continue to look around the city, we see that everyone's clothing is odd. They're wearing these bracelets right? And they have these headbands. If you would look back at the text right there, you shall bind them, the laws of God, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Everyone's wearing these bracelets and these headbands. It's a little strange, right? And, and nobody knows if Moses is being literal here or not. We're not sure. Is he being literal? Do we put the laws of God and the name of God on our, on our wrists? And on our foreheads, I don't think it's literal. I think what he's saying is that the education and the transmission of the gospel to your children needs to incorporate every area of life so that when they go with their hand to do something, it's like the law of God is on their hand, governing it, governing their actions, governing their deeds. Amen? And when they go to think something, their perspective, their eyesight, everything they do is governed by the very law of God. So as we go through this consecrated city, we also see these consecrated people all living according to the laws of God. <clears throat> and even the calendar of that community is consecrated. There's a special day each week that they remember the Lord their God, and they renew their covenant vows with that, and they come together in worship on the Lord's day. And there's festivals, and there's feasts, and if you could travel into one of the family homes on the feast day, listen to this, you would see the food there is a little distinct. It's a little unique. One second. <coughs> you're going to need the Holy Spirit this morning with all that coffin. So I hope you got it. And you're going to see on that table, you're going to see that lamb. And that lamb's not just a beautiful, delicious meal. See, this is a holy city, a consecrated city, that everything is symbolic. Everything speaks in the language of symbol, not only to the adults, but to the children. The children grow up in this, this symbolic world where everyone has the laws of God in their head and on their hands. It, it's plastered on the architecture, and the lamb is being presented, and that is a, a picture and a type of the Messiah. Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain. Son, we shed this blood of this lamb on the doorpost back in Egypt many years ago before you were born. And that's, this meal right here just says everything. It says the whole gospel. And then you reach over for the bitter herbs. And we don't celebrate the Passover in the same way we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But remember, we're in an ancient Israelite town. And son, you see these bitter herbs. I hate those, daddy. I, those are disgusting. And you, you're going to eat them, though. And you, you eat those bitter herbs, that little kid, and he starts to cry. And you say, those tears, those were the tears of the Israelites. Those were our tears in slavery, son. <laughs> Everything on the table, the table itself, the homes, the, the households all have Christian words and Bible rules and laws and gods all over the place. But then you also hear things 
As you walk through the town, what do you hear? You hear psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So the God's coming at the children through their eyes and through their ears and through their schedules and their calendars, through their, through their mouths. You smell the incense, which represents the prayers of the Lord. You hear the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs, and you hear the holy conversation. This is a lost art, by the way, holy conversation. Notice what it tells us in the text. You shall talk about my statutes and my testimonies. You should meditate on the word of God as you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, that's on your way to work. So as you walk, as we walk through this ancient Israelite town, we hear people chattering and talking about God all over the place. Isn't that something? It's just holy conversation going on in psalms and hymns and, and smells and sights and, and decorations on the very architecture. And if we were to walk down the road to the synagogue, you know, this is a big town. They have a synagogue and the synagogue has enough resources to have a school. You know, a, a lot of people can homeschool, but when you have a big enough town, you need a school where a lot of people come together and they pool their resources to be able to help those who can't homeschool, right? Or to help those that this is a better method for them. And so this particular synagogue we're visiting has some good resources and its members tithe and they pull their weight and they have a little synagogue school there. Amen. And that's something. And as we go into that synagogue school and we walk into the classrooms, we hear recitations. We hear creeds, we hear confessions, we hear pledges being made to the Lord Yahweh, amen? And we hear stories being told of Christ. And even when stories are told that aren't necessarily sacred stories, those stories are in alignment and teach the, the word of God and teach the value of Christ, amen? And, and you go into the office of that synagogue school and you open up that manual and you read that statement of faith and it's in perfect alignment with the word of God. And you turn over to the discipline the discipline, you know, sorry kids, there's a discipline policy. And that discipline policy takes into consideration that humans are created in the image of God. And that these are covenant kids bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they are to be disciplined as children of the king. And so everywhere you go, it's just a saturated environment of Christ. See, that is the environment which is conducive to our children and our grandchildren's maximum fruitfulness. It's not just the teaching, but it is the cultivation of a community over a long period of time so that when that child is born, it's born into a Christian town. He's born into a place where the sights and the sounds and the smells and the walls shout the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you're moved by this. It's a holy city. It's a consecrated environment. And not every Christian gets this. Many of us didn't get this. Many of us were not born into this particular world. But what if we could give this to our grandchildren? What if we could give this to them? What if the plant that we purchased at Lowe's could be raised in an environment conducive to its maximum fruitfulness? Rather than surviving, it gets to thrive. Because, because, we followed God's laws in the power of the Holy Spirit, not only taught, but we built together this long-term Christian community for our children. Amen? I think this is the goal. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. And you've heard this before, amen? It's mostly talking about money, but you know what's more wealth? What's more wealth? more valuable than money, a covenantal Christian, distinctly Christian community. You've all thought about this. I've talked to you. You've thought about, I want to have money for my great grandchildren. I want to have money for my grandchildren. That's awesome. Let's do that. Okay. They need resources to advance the kingdom too. But what if you could give them an environment conducive to their maximum thriving? What if you could deliver to them a community? Wow. Amen. You know, that's going to take time and money and resources and commitment and loyalty and perseverance. That's going to take everything. One or two people can't pull that off. It's going to take a lot of people committed to leaving their great-grandchildren a wonderful inheritance if we're going to do this together. Amen? Amen. So households, this needs to be true at the dinner table. It needs to be true in your family. It needs to be true in our church. It needs to be true at every ministry that we do. It's a community. Amen. And we got to work together to build it. Let's all stand and pray.